Guys, I'm excited. Are you excited? Less than a week from Halloween. This month has really flown by. The only spooky things I've had the chance to do this month were watch Smile 2 and Terrifier 3. A little bummed about that, but we still have a week. Ish. So I figured since there's no new movie for me to review this week, I thought what better time than to rank all 13 of the Halloween movies. It's been about two years since I've talked about the Halloween movies on here, and that was only the Blumhouse trilogy, which if you saw that video, you can probably already predict a few of these movie spots. It was super fun to sit down and rewatch all of them back to back to back, including Season of the Witch, which I had never seen up until this past week. We've got a lot of ground to cover, but before we get into this, spoiler alert, obviously, if you're new here and you want more videos, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. All right, but that all being said, let's talk about Halloween. So coming in at spot 13, sitting firmly at the bottom is Halloween Resurrection, the franchise's lowest point. This movie commits the unforgivable sin of undoing the perfect conclusion of Halloween H2O, where Laurie Strode finally triumphed over Michael Myers by decapitating him. Resurrection reveals that Laurie actually killed an innocent paramedic instead, not Michael, effectively erasing the emotional impact and closure that H2O provided, and it was also kind of badass. <laughs> Really unhappy about that. This retcon feels like a slap in the face to fans and undermines Lori's entire journey. The plot this time around centers around a reality TV show called Dangertainment, where college students spend a night in the Myers house, oblivious to the real danger lurking within. The concept might have seemed edgy for the early 2000s. I'm pretty sure this is whenever shows like Big Brother and Survivor and stuff were really taken off. So this feels almost kind of like Halloween meets Big Brother, but it quickly devolves into a gimmicky mess. The characters are forgettable stereotypes who make the worst decisions imaginable, which this franchise is no stranger to doing, but it's really bad here. These characters are probably the ones that feel the most like fodder for Michael's rampage. The inclusion of Buster Rhymes as Freddie Harris, who astonishingly defeats Michael using kung fu moves for the moment, pushes the film into the realm of absurdity. This portrayal diminishes the terror of the iconic villain, turning him into a joke rather than a figure of horror, which slashers in the 90s were guilty of doing, such as A Nightmare on Elm Street and Friday the 13th. No one was really taking these characters seriously anymore, and Resurrection unfortunately followed suit. In the end, Resurrection not only tarnishes the legacy of the previous films, but also fails to deliver any genuine scares or suspense. Michael's mask is a step up from H2O, but not by much. He just looks like he's wearing makeup now. The reliance on early 2000s internet culture dates the film horribly, and the found footage style that's used here and there lacks the finesse to be effective. By disregarding the emotional depth and impactful ending of H2O and offering nothing of substance in return, Halloween Resurrection earns its place as the worst film in the series. All right, up next, spot number 12, just above the bottom is Halloween Ends, a film that left me feeling both baffled and disappointed. After the adrenaline-fueled events of Halloween Kills, I was pretty eager for a satisfying conclusion for the Blumhouse trilogy. Instead, the movie takes an unexpected and unwelcomed detour by focusing on a new character, Corey Cunningham. Corey's descent into darkness becomes the central narrative, sidelining both Michael Myers and Laurie Strode, you know, the pillars of the franchise. Michael's noticeable absence throughout much of the film is a significant letdown and probably what pissed most of the fans off. Fans, myself included, were anticipating an epic final showdown of some sort between Laurie and Michael, um, what the marketing seemed to imply, a culmination of decades of tension and terror, if you will, which not really anymore since they erased all of the sequels, which ended up not even really mattering since they turned Michael supernatural anyways. Just, I can't even get into it. I hate this timeline. Instead, we basically get a disjointed story that feels more like a spinoff than a finale. The exploration of evil's influence on individuals could have been intriguing, but in a different context. Or even if Corey was introduced in 2018, but here it feels severely misplaced. More than that, Halloween Ends robs the Blumhouse trilogy of a satisfying conclusion. The pacing is slow, the atmosphere is off, the kills are really nothing to write home about, and the characters we've invested in are given insufficient attention. The opening scene is probably the only thing that I can really give the film credit for. Nothing spectacular, but it wasn't bad. Bottom line though, it feels as if the filmmakers wanted to tell a different story entirely. The result is a film that's weird, boring, and out of place, leaving me and many other fans feeling shortchanged. Not a good note to go out on. The kitchen fight in the finale that was teased in all of the trailers was very underwhelming. Michael Myers finally being killed and crowd surfed was a choice. Anything else I've got to say is really nothing nice. So moving on to spot 11, we have Rob Zombie's Halloween 2. Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 amplifies the issue that I had with his remake of the original. While Zombie is undeniably a talented filmmaker with a unique vision, 
His style clashes with what I love about the Halloween franchise. This sequel delves even deeper into the graphic violence, the over-the-top profanity, the mean-spiritedness of his universe, creating a very grime atmosphere that's difficult to really get through. The film continues to explore Laurie Strode's trauma, portraying her mental breakdown in a chaotic and disorienting manner. While the depiction of PTSD is a valid angle, the execution here feels messy and lacks subtlety. The surreal hallucinations involving Michael's mother and a white horse are meant to provide psychological depth, but instead comes across as pretentious and confusing. These elements distract from the core narrative and make it challenging to connect with the characters. Following that, the movie is overloaded with unnecessary grime, overshadowing any attempts at meaningful storytelling. Even Octavia Spencer and Daniel Harris couldn't salvage this mess. And Scout Taylor Compton. While her Laurie Strode isn't necessarily my favorite iteration throughout the timelines or whatever, she did an alright job. The brutality here also feels excessive, and the lack of likable characters make it hard to invest in emotionally. In the end, Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 embodies the same issues as its predecessor, but intensifies them, resulting in a film that's more exhausting than engaging. So now moving on to spot number 10. With that being said, you can probably already guess which one that's going to be. We have Rob Zombie's Halloween for spot number 10. Rob Zombie's remake of Halloween is a polarizing entry that for me misses the mark due to its stylistic choices. While the film is competently made and features solid performances from Scout Taylor Compton, Dee Wallace in a small role, Daniel Harris and Brad Dwarf, it's burdened by an overabundance of graphic content. Like I get this is his style, but it is just so hard to get through. The excessive sex, nudity, profanity, and gratuitous violence create this mean-spirited tone that detracts from the story and is just extremely amplified in the sequel. I can't get through these movies anymore. Like I could whenever I was a teenager, when I was young, I didn't really have too much of an issue getting through the Rob Zombie movies, but now they are just really a chore to get through. I just, I can't. The attempt in this one to delve into Michael Myers' backstory by exploring his dysfunctional family life is intriguing on paper. However, the execution is overshadowed by the film's unnecessary grime and bleakness. The abusive environment is depicted with such intensity that it physically becomes uncomfortable to watch and not in a way that serves the narrative, especially with this one scene that happens in the director's cut, which is for some reason the only version of the movie that seems to exist easily to watch. It's very nasty and very gross and hard to get through and just makes me wonder why it was even included, but it is. When the movie transitions to replicating Carpenter's original in the third act though, it obviously lacks the suspense since you know what's gonna happen and the atmosphere that made the 1978 film a classic because Rob Zombie is really all about that grime and grittiness, so we don't really have the same atmosphere. Zombie's distinct style is evident, but it doesn't align with my appreciation or many people's appreciation for the franchise's roots. The relentless darkness and lack of subtlety makes it hard to connect with the characters or become invested in their fates. While I respect Zombie's filmmaking abilities, his vision for Halloween just doesn't resonate with me, placing this remake lower on my list. All right, coming in at ninth place. In ninth place, this might be a controversial pick. I don't know, it's been a while since the movie's come out, so I'm hoping recency bias has officially worn off by now, but you never know. In ninth place, we have Halloween, Halloween 2018, a film that despite all the legacy sequel hype and its potential, falls flat due to its generic and uninspired execution. Acting as a direct sequel to the 1978 classic and erasing all the other sequels, it had an opportunity to revitalize the franchise. Instead, it delivers a by-the-number slasher that lacks innovation and fails to capture the suspense of the original. The awkward humor is also a bit of a chore to cringe through. And not only that, it really pisses me off that they erased everything within the franchise because they you know, just thought their movie was so good, and in some attempt to give us a more realistic and grounded version of Michael Myers, just to turn around and give us a supernatural Michael Myers by the end of Kills and throughout the entirety of Ends. Just like, why? Why would you? The whole way that they treat the other movies and Michael's legacy and the Blumhouse movies, it's like they wanted to have their cake and eat it too. Michael Myers has been locked up for 40 years. He hasn't done anything to anybody. He's solely killed those people on Halloween night in the original movie. That is it, nothing else, no, n nothing. And yet they still talk about him and act like he's this big bad boogeyman serial killer. Uh, we have to hunt him, We're, we always fight him. No, you don't, no, you don't, because it erased everything. This movie erased everything. So no, you don't always fight him. No, he doesn't always do this. He's not this 
big, bad, scary boogeyman. He's just a man. And that is why I have such an issue with this movie because they really thought that their idea and movie was so good that they erased everything just to give us essentially the exact same thing whenever all was said and done, except you really didn't deserve it or earn it because you erased everything that made this character what he's known by from audiences, not the people in Haddonfield. Even if the other sequels were included, most people in Haddonfield weren't around or witnessed any of Michael's bullshit. In the movies here, it treats it as if people just somehow telepathically know about all of Michael Myers' rampage and carnage that also never happened, but somehow still instilled fear in the town for 40 years. You know what, I'm working myself up here. It was a bad idea and the movie handled it poorly. Jamie Lee Curtis, of course, returns as Laurie Strode, now a reclusive survivalist preparing for Michael's inevitable return. While her performance is strong, it's Jamie Lee Curtis, duh, the character development feels shallow. The dynamics between Lori, her estranged daughter Karen, and granddaughter Allison are underexplored, leaving emotional threads dangling. The new characters also don't bring much depth and their arcs are predictable. Uh, Michael Myers himself doesn't really feel particularly menacing in this installment. The scares are telegraphed and the tension never quite builds up properly. The film plays it safe, relying on nostalgia and familiar tropes, fan service, all of that, rather than offering fresh scares or a compelling narrative. It's not a bad movie per se, but it's disappointingly bland and definitely doesn't stand out in a crowded genre. This is probably the most forgettable Halloween movie for me in my opinion. Following that up, we now have a pick that may, I may lose a lot of credibility here, especially with this movie being above Halloween 2018. Coming in at eighth place, we have Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. Landing in eighth place, I can guarantee that this is a controversial pick. Um, Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers is a film that falters due to its convoluted Cult of Thorn storyline. But there's just something about the old, like, late 90s slasher vibes that I just find somewhat comforting about it. Not a good movie by any means. It's not great. It's not good. But I prefer watching it over Halloween 2018. I just find it a little bit more entertaining. Sue me. Anyways, this one attempts to explain Michael's immortality and murderous impulses through an ancient druid curse. Yeah, I know. Which is just like a total misstep that strips away the mysterious terror that defines Michael. The supernatural explanation overcomplicates the character who thrives on simplicity and mystery. The movie also suffers from production issues that led to multiple cuts. The producer's cut, which I know is floating around out there somewhere. Haven't seen it myself yet, but I do look forward to checking it out in the future. But yeah, this one's just got a really disjointed narrative. Despite the flaws though, like I said, there are some redeeming qualities like the atmosphere, appropriately eerie, and the return of Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis. Even though this is his last movie, sadly, he didn't even get a chance to finish filming his scenes. It is nice. It doesn't really feel like a Halloween movie without Dr. Loomis or Jamie Lee Curtis in it. So it was nice to have one of the two in this one. Then you got a young Paul Rudd who portrays Tommy Doyle, bringing an intriguing, although somewhat underdeveloped and sometimes weird vibe to the story. However, the fully fleshed out Cult of Florin plot feels out of place and seriously detracts from the core essence of the Halloween series. It turns Michael into a pawn rather than the embodiment of pure evil. While Halloween Halloween 6 isn't the worst in the franchise. It's muddled storyline, lackluster reveal of Dr. Wynn, who no one really even remembers, being the man in black in this movie and in 5. Don't worry, we'll be getting to that. It just feels like such a departure compared to the franchise's stronger entries, which is why it has earned itself spot number 8. Following that up though, we're actually going to go back in time for this movie, coming in at 7th place, and this movie isn't really that much better than this movie. It really just depends on my mood for that day, but coming in at spot number 7, today I slightly prefer Halloween 5, The Revenge of Michael Myers just a little bit more than Halloween 6, The Curse of Michael Myers. Halloween 5 is a film that I have a bit of a love-hate relationship with. On one hand, it exudes the comfy late 80s vibe that I adore, immersing me in nostalgia every time I watch it. The autumn atmosphere, the classic Halloween setting, all add to its charm. However, the film also introduces the early stages of the Cult of Thorn storyline, specifically with the mysterious Man in Black. This subplot is poorly explained and feels completely shoehorned in. It feels more confusing than scary, like I maybe missed something from the previous movie. I did not though, this storyline was lazily thrown in at the last minute for this movie. The supernatural elements begin to creep in, complicating the straightforward terror that the series initially excelled at, at least with the first two movies. Despite these flaws though, there are highlights worth mentioning. The dynamic between Jamie and Rachel is engaging even though it doesn't last for very long. Their characters are sympathetic and easy to root for. At least Jamie is still somewhat. 
Rachel kind of gets a bit of a character change and she's not exactly the same character that she was in the fourth movie. Then, you know, she dies immediately in the like first 20 minutes. So that's a bit of a bummer. The chase sequences though are somewhat suspenseful and Michael manages to retain just that little bit of mysterious essence about him for now. It's completely destroyed in Halloween 6. While Halloween 5 isn't without its issues, it's nostalgic appeal and moments of genuine horror keep it in the middle of my ranking. Nothing to write home about. Very, very average, very basic Halloween movie. Still more entertaining than Halloween 2018 though. I'm sorry. All right, coming in at spot number six. In sixth place is the unique and often misunderstood Halloween 3 season of The Witch. Departing entirely from the Michael Myers narrative, the film dares to explore a new direction within the Halloween universe. Initially met with confusion and disappointment by fans expecting another slasher featuring The Shape, it has since gained appreciation for its originality and bold storytelling. The plot revolves around a sinister corporation, Silver Shamrock, and their evil plan to sacrifice children using cursed Halloween masks. The film masterfully creates an unsettling atmosphere with the incessantly catchy yet creepy Silver Shamrock jingle. You know you've all heard it. The inclusion of a meta gag, a commercial for the original Halloween playing in the background, acknowledges the franchise's roots without necessarily relying on them. It's just a fun little Easter egg. <laughs> The immortal classic, followed by the big gift. Anyways though, I admire Season of the Witch for shaking things up and offering a fresh standalone horror story. While it's not a slasher and lacks Michael Myers, obviously, it captures the spirit of Halloween in a way that's both innovative and chilling. I really wish that they would have kept up with this anthology for a new Halloween story every year for the Halloween franchise. I think that could have been a really cool idea. You see how that turned out, but its willingness to take risks and provide a different kind of scare earns itself a respectable spot on my list, regardless of its lack of Michael Myers. All right, we have officially made it to the top five. Kicking off our top five, we have the original Halloween 2. This one is a sequel that seamlessly continues the terrifying events of the original. Picking up immediately where the first film left off, it places Laurie Strode in the vulnerable setting of Haddonfield Memorial Hospital. The claustrophobic environment enhances the suspense and the film maintains much of the tension that made its predecessor such a classic. However, this is where the franchise's quality begins to fluctuate. The introduction of the sibling twist that Laurie is Michael's sister adds a new layer to the story, but it also shifts the narrative focus. Some fans appreciate the added motivation for Michael, while others feel it detracts from his portrayal as pure motiveless evil. Personally, I believe it starts to steer the series away from its original simplicity. Unless you're related to Lori or no Lori, you're seemingly not in any danger. It does kind of change and shift here and there uh, in later installments, but that's kind of where it decides to go in this movie, and I just don't think it was the best direction for such a simple plot like the original. The film is also known for increasing the gore and body count, aligning with the evolving slasher trends of the early 80s, which was also thanks to the original Halloween and Friday the 13th somewhat at the time. While this isn't inherently negative, it does mark a departure from the atmosphere, horror, and tension of the original. Despite these shifts though, Halloween 2 remains a strong entry that effectively extends the Night of Terror, securing its place in the upper half of my ranking. Alright, now following that, in fourth place we have Halloween Kills. Halloween Kills is an adrenaline-fueled ride from start to finish. Picking up immediately after the 2018 installment, it thrusts us back into the chaos as Michael Myers escapes the fiery trap set by Laurie Strode. The pace is relentless, the kills are gruesome and inventive, and the film never lets up on the action. One of the standout aspects is how terrifying Michael Myers is portrayed in this one. He's more brutal and unstoppable than ever, making him genuinely scary again, even more so than in the 2018 film, which I didn't really think he was that intimidating at all. The return of legacy characters like Lindsay Wallace and Tommy Doyle adds a nostalgic touch that fans, including myself, appreciate. While just leaning a little bit too much into the fan service side of things, I do find myself appreciating when I see old legacy characters pop up here and there sometimes. I think it's cool, I like it sometimes. The flashback scene to 1978 is also particularly impressive, capturing the aesthetic and atmosphere and the Donald Pleasantness of it all perfectly. It might just be my favorite part of the movie. I really, really enjoy the 1978 flashback opening for this movie. Also, not to mention Allison being a total baddie in the sequel. I mean, just like, look at her go. Oh, oh shit. Oh. Um, well, well, there she goes, you know what, never mind. <laughs> However, Halloween Kills isn't without its flaws. The whole Evil Dies Tonight mob subplot is so overdone. Evil Dies Tonight thing, I just, I can't with it. Into this. Evil dies tonight. And then you got these characters making some of the worst decisions in the franchise's history. And then you also have the scene where an innocent man, Tivoli, is driven to jumping to his death at the hospital in an overly tragic 
is driven to jumping to his death at the hospital. It feels overly tragic and severely out of place, bringing the film a bit, quite a bit down for me. Lori is also sidelined in the hospital even more so than in Halloween 2, if you could believe it, which is disappointing. Additionally, Karen's limited screen time before being killed by Michael off at the end feels like a huge missed opportunity. Despite these issues though, the film is undeniably fun and delivers on the horror and excitements and bloody gory kills that fans are craving for this installment. It's not the franchise's best by any means, but it is an entertaining installment that keeps the spirit of Halloween alive. All right, we have made it to our top three. Now, obviously one of these picks is going to be a no brainer, but without further ado, let's go ahead and unveil my top three Halloween movies. Claiming the third spot is Halloween 4, a solid and enjoyable entry that brings Michael Myers back into the fold after his absence in Season of the Witch. This film does a fantastic job of capturing the essence of Halloween with its opening credits perfectly setting the autumn vibes that immerse you in the season and the film. Admittedly, the mask in this one is pretty awful. It's expressionless and ill-fitting, undercutting really any menacing presence that Michael Myers usually has. The infamous blonde haired mask with a pink face that appears in one scene is laughably bad. However, the film compensates with strong storytelling, cinematography, and character development. The bandaged look Michael sports at the beginning is also a cool touch. I think it would have been cool if we saw him throughout the movie a little bit more like that. The whole mask situations after the first two movies just completely baffles me. Not sure why it was so hard to just make or get the original mask back or make one that looked similar enough to the original it's just it's bad here the mask situation isn't as bad as say the way another movie in this franchise handles it but we'll get to that in a little bit because while this film may have one of the more goofier looking michael myers the film compensates with strong storytelling and character development jamie lloyd and rachel carruthers are sympathetic and compelling protagonists worth rooting for their relationship adds emotional depth and their performances elevate the film. The rooftop scene is also a standout, delivering high tension and suspense. And while the kills are relatively tame for an R-rated film, almost feeling PG-13, the movie excels in building atmosphere and delivers a shocking ending that leaves a pretty solid lasting impression. Dr. Loomis is back and more manic than ever. Halloween 4 may not be the scariest or bloodiest in the series, but it definitely offers a well-rounded Halloween experience with great characters and style, making it a must watch during October. All right, coming in at spot number two, nearly missing the top spot is Halloween H2O, a film that brilliantly revitalized the franchise by bringing back Jamie Lee Curtis as Laurie Strode, ignoring all the convoluted sequels that came before it, except for Halloween 2. Although if you pay special attention to the credits in the beginning of the film for H2O, you can maybe find some Easter eggs from 4, 5, and 6 here and there. I thought that was a cool little nod to the other films. Anyways, H2O provides a seamless continuation that feels respectful to the original story. This approach is executed much better here than in the 2018 reboot. This movie also embraces a 90s vibe that's both nostalgic and refreshing for the franchise at the time. It seems to take a few notes from Scream, which is fitting since, you know, Kevin Williamson was like a producer on this. And since Halloween obviously was, you know, playing during the Scream finale, it's a nod to the influence that Carpenter's films had on the genre. And I like how they reference those movies back here in this one. The opening kill featuring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Marion set the tone with suspense and serves as a great start to the film. Jamie Lee Curtis once again shines as Laurie, portraying her with a mix of vulnerability and strength. The final confrontation between Laurie and Michael is definitely satisfying, way more satisfying than the 2018 movie. Their game of hide and seek throughout the school is tense and Lori's decision to face Michael head on showcases her evolution as a character from the original. The climax where she decapitates Michael with an axe that provides a satisfying and definitive end to their saga. It just makes me that much more upset that Resurrection came and ruined all of it. And realistically, the only significant flaw that I have with this movie is the inconsistency of Michael's mask, which varies in quality. One version looks round and alien-like, while another is tight with frizzy hair and visible eyes. The use of a CGI mask in one scene is also particularly jarring. And I guess you could also say that he doesn't really kill too many people in this movie, although it's not really the focal point for this sequel. It's more so just about going back to the basics and the roots of the original, so the lack of kills doesn't really bother me too much. Overall, I would say that Halloween H2O is a solid film that delivers both on scares and emotional payoff, earning its well-deserved second spot. All right, well, we've made it to the top of my list and no secret here, obviously at the top of my ranking is of course the timeless classic Halloween, the one that came out in 1978 and was directed by John Carpenter. Didn't think I would need to specify all of that, but we've got like three movies that are named just Halloween. So 
better safe than sorry. But anyways, this is the film that not only started the franchise, but also set the standard for the slasher genre, especially Friday the 13th. However, no sequel or ripoff could match this film's simplicity. Simplicity is this film's strength and the straightforward plot that allows for masterful storytelling and suspense that remains effective to this day. John Carpenter's direction is superb, utilizing lighting and shadows to keep Michael Myers hidden as the shape, enhancing the mystery surrounding him. The iconic score is also instantly recognizable and contributes significantly to the film's eerie atmosphere. Michael feels the most human here, has a very mysterious presence whose lack of motive makes him all the more terrifying. Definitely my favorite and probably everybody's favorite version of Michael Myers, I guess unless you're like a gore hound or something. Definitely the most eerie, mysterious, and creepy version of Michael Myers in my opinion. We also have Jamie Lee Curtis here who first introduces us to Laurie Strode, one of the most iconic final girls in horror history. While she hasn't yet become the hardened survivor seen in later films, by any means, girls tripping over nothing. Hey! Oh! Oh! Help! Her portrayal of innocence and resilience is compelling. The film's influence is also immeasurable. It literally set the blueprint for all slashers that followed. Though it's obviously dated in some aspects, the story itself feels timeless. Halloween 1978 is a masterpiece of horror cinema and without a doubt deserves the top spot on this list. All right guys, that about wraps things up here. It's been a sec since I've done a video ranking something with this many movies in it. You can just already tell that editing is gonna be a bit. Anyways, if you're new here and you liked what you saw, please consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really like what you saw, hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you know whenever I post new videos. As always, thank you guys so much for your support. I love you all and I'll see you in the next one.